So we so we've had a full day of talk about payments and e-commerce and retail and um, you and I had a brief conversation on the phone the other day and we came to the conclusion that that this we're going to talk about something else right now which is the AI hype machine. And you I don't know if you maybe that was my phrase. So let's talk about the AI hype machine. There's there's a lot of noise right now both I mean in payments businesses in basically any sector you want about artificial intelligence how it's disrupting businesses already. I, I know for a fact there are investors that really do not know what they're even investing in right now, but you put AI like at, you know more than a dozen times in a deck, you got my $5 million. So what, I mean, point of view um, from a company that I'm sure um, is looking at this space closely, what's real, what's not, um, how, how do you evaluate what's going on right now? Sure, so I, um, I will get into the AI, but first can I say the chairs? Yes. Pretty. Uh, so the ch I don't know if you guys have been to a Recode event before. Like the the chairs are a thing. Um, and uh, the, the in the 2007 interview with uh, uh, with uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, the really famous one. Uh, that it was one of the very few they did together. They had the red chairs. And I didn't realize you let like muggles sit on the chairs. <laughs> These are actually no. They are the real ones. I was just going to make a joke. Make are they, are they steel case? They are steel case. Good. That'd be embarrassing if they yes. weren't. Yes. Um, Buy them on eBay. Um, <laughs> so uh, okay, so yeah, AI. Um, uh, this is interesting for me because at least when you when you live in the valley, it feels like you can't kind of uh, you know you can't cross the road without uh, you know bumping into three AI startups and kind of everyone, no matter what they're doing, is a is an AI startup these days. Um, and, and so you you actually have to. to start to peel it apart and it feels like all the trends we've been hearing about you know we we're promised big data uh, over the past five years and isn't that sort of the same thing and, and what does it mean these days and, and it's interesting because I guess like any of these big trends like mobile was in in 2005 through 2010 um, there is there's a bunch of truth and then there's a bunch of hype and it's 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 hard to pull them uh, apart a bit I haven't been down to the money 2020 show floor but I presume there's a bunch of AI there um, the the thing that's the stuff that's real and that we think is is really interesting is one we have just made uh, a bunch of advances in industrial machine learning and knowing how to do machine learning well at scale on large corpuses of data for for interesting things like what Stripe used it for is uh, is fraud detection uh, and so we, we can get into that a bit later but we're just getting much better progressively as a, as a society and we have much more data to to train the models on which makes them more accurate um, the other thing that's real is uh, all the uh, the, the deep learning advances we've made over the past five years. And so, you know, this is the famous, uh, uh, you know, Google is now really good at recognizing images of cats, which is good because a lot of those on the internet. Um, uh, they, they also had the, the famous video of uh, DeepMind playing uh, uh, Atari Breakout uh, and getting really good at that. Uh, and that is all, there's basically, there is um, this technique called uh, deep learning where it's, it's uh, and the term neural network has been around since the 1950s uh, and uh, it's a, a deep network, so there's many layers in it uh, and for the longest problem they just had the um, the problem of uh, they wouldn't learn very well uh, and then uh, th there was this uh, online uh, contest where people would train their uh, deep networks and uh, this all sounds very scary to me no, no 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 it's great uh, because I mean now we we're better at recognizing cats but um, uh, so uh, they would train their, their, their deep networks and uh, all of a sudden in about 2012 we got good at, uh, at deep networks uh, and this is where the kind of Google Photos, uh, recognizing images of faces stuff comes out, uh, out of. There's actually a bunch of really interesting advances that fall out of that. One, uh, we're very good at relatively cheaply uh, recognizing photos and recognizing kind of things like faces from videos. Uh, and we're very good at text to speech and uh, uh, speech to text as a result. And we haven't even seen all the results of that. Like DeepMind just published some early um, uh, results from their from their text to speech stuff. But what that means then is I think we're, now we're going to see all the all these um, uh, uh, n new use cases fall out as a result, and so uh, you know you're just talking about uh, you know the the use case that would be awesome of uh, uh, an app that tells you if you wore something to to go meet with someone else the the, the other day. It actually you know f just literally five years ago that would have been pretty hard from a from an AI perspective, and now that's the kind of app that that, that you can make fairly easily from an AI perspective. And so we're we're pretty excited about all the the things that are going to come out of basically much better image recognition much better um, uh, voice recognition. 
So you talked about everything that's that's working, but I wa I thought we were gonna get you know I thought we were gonna call out some 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 pieces of uh, uh, stuff that that's out there as as uh, fraudulent or hype, but um, I, I just, I, as a reporter trying to cover the space, it's it's pretty hard from the outset. I mean, uh, chat bought this and chat bought that, and I'm just wondering if, if that noise affects your business at all, or or do you, in terms of focusing on wh wh where you guys should be spending your time and energy, or or you or or do you have your mind made up on on how AI affects your business already? We, we try not to um, pay too much attention to the, the hype cycles that come along because you know, you've all seen the, the Gartner hype cycle curve that there's this massive swoosh up at the beginning and then you know, the plateau of productivity, which is much lower than the hype, don't forget, uh, kind of uh, comes along later. And uh, and you have all these things, uh, you know, people asking me what our VR strategy for. It's like what, um, and, uh, and and so we try not to pay too much attention to to that kind of stuff, especially because we're not at risk of running out of work in our long-term trends, basically, in that uh, you know, we spent the past five years expanding Stripe internationally and connecting more places. There's a bunch more work to be done there. There are many more countries to, uh, to, uh, to, to light up. And you know, a bunch of them we're doing now are pretty hard. We're beta testing Stripe in Brazil and Mexico. And I mean, that's, that's some pretty, uh, pretty naughty challenges in, in getting those underway. And similarly, uh, with, our, with our business platform, things like Atlas. And so, we, we tend to stick more to those things. And then people use Stripe for really interesting end applications, which can include uh, chatbots and stuff like this, but we are not directly uh, kind of on the consumer layer, if that makes sense. Got it. So let's, let's talk about the core of, of Stripe's business today for a second. Um, you know, when it's you all chatbots. All chatbots. When when we talk to develop, you know, you talk to developers, you'll, you'll hear a lot of love for Stripe. Um, when I talk to, um, I'd say more old school people who have grown up in the payments industry, some of them will look at Stripe and say, $5 billion valuation. Um, this is a tough business with tough margins. Um, I'm going to say the C word, which um, is commodity. You know, increasingly, increas C word. In increasingly commoditized business. Um, you know, there's can, can the Stripe just grow as e-commerce grows and at the same pace? And um, is that really a $5 billion business? Or is there some breakout into new business lines that we haven't seen yet? And that, and five years from now, we'll look at Stripe and say, oh, this isn't just a payments company. This is a, I don't know, I'm going to use a operating system of, you know, for, for developers. You know, everyone's an operating system. Or how, how do you... How do you think about, I'm sure you get, maybe you don't get to your face, but how do you think about the sort of the commodity, the commodity angle and, and where Stripe's real value comes from? No, uh, d don't worry. We've raised uh, several rounds of fundraising for Stripe, and so that question has come up just, uh, just once or twice. Um, so, so, so one, I will say, you know, th th there is not some... Uh, grand rabbit out of the hash second stage for Stripe that you haven't seen yet. Uh, uh, or if there is, Patrick hasn't told me about it. Uh, and um, and so we kind of happily talk about what's in our future. Uh, and we think uh, those trends are actually re really important uh, and, and, and are going to become a big business. But there, there isn't any you know wild pivot off in the future. Um, and so... The, the question we often get, which is some variant of, isn't this a commodity? Isn't this uninteresting? People have been doing payments for a long time. There's a lot of people in the payment space. Um, isn't it a winner-takes-all market, which are actually contradictory statements? Uh, we, we get all these sorts of, of questions. Um, and I think there is, uh, there's a few things at play here. One is uh, we think very few companies are actually taking the global commerce opportunity and the global interconnectivity seriously enough. Uh, and the reason they're not is because in many cases, the market isn't there yet. Uh, and so... Uh, the e-commerce e market or... Yeah, exactly. If, yep. if you kind of just justify it on, on existing market statistics. Uh, and so we are now launching Stripe in all these places. Like we are, like I said, we're you know, beta testing in Hong Kong. We're beta testing in Mexico. You know, if we were just working on near-term 
Hoas maximizes our return on, on kind of development effort, we would not be going and do, doing those things. However, we think that part of the reason that you don't see as much cross-border trade as maybe you should is because the commerce infrastructure has been dreadful for the longest time. And you know, one of the big trends we talk about, which we're increasingly investing in, is moving beyond just credit card payments. And so we have betas up and running for Ideal, which is this local payment method in the Netherlands, for bank debits in Europe, for, you know, we have our partnership with Alipay in, in China. But we, we think just the fact that if you want to start a business tomorrow and to sell to, you know, internet users generally, the fact that that isn't really possible is, is to us really surprising. Uh, and the market for that doesn't exist yet because that hasn't Happen. So, so that is one multi-year area of investment for us, uh, and so that's kind of, uh, I loved, um, you, you remember uh, Tesla had the master plan on their blog, uh, like since about 10 years ago, where they talked about the, the secret Tesla plan of, you know, step one, produce the Roadster, and then step two, the Model uh, uh, S, and then the Model 3. Um, and uh, it's a little bit like that with Stripe, where th this is the secret master plan. So one is the global part. Two is, um, w w when we would have these conversations, uh, with say investors um, uh, about Stripe, we would invariably get the, the response of you know oh payments really crowded space you know awful lot of people doing this um, terrible uh, margins uh, right to, 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 you know terrible market to be in a and then our, our most effective retort to that would honestly be if you actually went and talked to any developer or any entrepreneur building a business online you know all the the companies uh, the kinds of companies Kirsten mentioned back in you know 2010. You, you go talk to these companies and say, what's dealing with payments like? And they were tearing their hair out. Oftentimes, you have companies who were dealing with really interesting, industry-changing products and really hard technologies. And just accepting money for what they built was the hardest thing they, they did. And so it was interesting, because I actually think it's instructive. If anyone is looking for ideas for companies to start, I think this is a good place to search, is where you have on the one hand the industry observers and kind of the common received wisdom being like, oh, that's cre really crowded and lots of people are doing it. But then when you actually go talk to the customers in the market, it's like they're, they're, they're really unhappy. And so we started off making um, accepting money easy, you know, literally give me an API that, you know, I can use to charge credit cards and put cash in my bank account. Quickly, what we realized was um, uh, one of the... One of the uh, Product founders I, I really like is, is Des Trainer from Intercom. I don't know if you follow his space that much, um, but uh, he's a big fan of this jobs to be hired uh, framework for products. That you know, wh what is the job the customer is hiring your product to do? Uh, and the, with Stripe, they're generally not looking to hire a credit card credit card processor. They're building a subscription e-commerce business, or they're building an on-demand marketplace, or something like that. And accepting credit card payments is like 10% of the work that. Uh, they actually th that actually goes into running that right. sort of business, and so the developer platform for building an online business th that intuitively made sense to us as developers. We had no idea if it would work because I mean, what did we know? I was literally 19 at the time when we were setting up Stripe. We had no experience in payments or commerce or I mean, anything. It was more or less my first job, uh, and. Um, uh, but, but I think this has actually proved to be a, a, a rich theme that we have gone and launched now. You know, Stripe Connect for marketplaces and our subscription offering and right. Stripe Atlas for incorporation. Last week we had the launch of, uh, I referenced it, Stripe Radar, which is our exposing all our machine learning systems that we've trained on a huge amount of Stripe data. So, um, okay, so the answer to the answer to the commodity question is go talk, go talk to the customers and, uh, or, the, or the, commodity, the commodity thing is just, is BS. And, and because, I mean, one, I'll go back to one of your products that you launched maybe, maybe over a year ago, which was something you call Stripe Relay, which was essentially trying to help, um, on one end, help retailers and merchants sell their products onto platforms that aren't necessarily commerce platforms, but platforms where people are spending a lot of time. So one of your early partners, big platform was Twitter, um, since moved back, since backed off from commerce a bit. And then the other side, you were platforms that felt like they, they could um, layer on commerce. And so when I saw that, I said to myself, oh, maybe they've tapped out on their core business. You know, you have a lot of, a lot of the big names. Your customers are on-demand companies. Venture capital for on-demand isn't what it was back then. So I said, hmm, you know, is this, is this sort of a, you know, reaching for growth? Um, and it seems like that business, that that one product, is still sort of in it, in its infancy. Um, so was I was I 
reading that right or what what am I confused about there? Yeah, I, I think you were reading it wrong uh, in that, uh, well, 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 just to say... I hear that like once or twice a day, once once at work, once at home. So. Uh, th- there's probably a smoother way to say that, but... Um, but uh, when you say about the core customer base, one, the, um, there's obviously an availability bias in that the, uh, the, star- the, the companies on Stripe that people talk about tend to be the well-known companies. Those are the, the, uh, the, the, the kind of the memorable names. But one of the things that I love about Stripe is, you know, in we now Insta- have Instacart or I- Lyft. I- exactly. The, the, the companies that are, are very well-known in the Valley and are very fast-growing and things like that. And, and to be clear, we, you know, those, are, those are very good customers and we work closely with them. That said, there are now these hundreds of thousands of really interesting businesses built on Stripe across, you know, the 25 countries where we operate and now through uh, through Stripe Atlas in even more countries. Uh, and w- one of the things that never ceases to get me excited is the fact that um, is the variety you see in uh, in those sorts of in the, those sorts of companies building on Stripe, and so it, it's on-demand companies like uh, like Instacart that uh, get all the headlines. But there's companies like you guys probably haven't heard of Gettable, which is uh, on-demand construction equipment. Uh, and so if you just need a you know backhoe for for the day, um, I uh, do. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. uh, uh, you can just uh-huh. log on to Gettable.com, and you know okay. it handles the payments and it handles the reviews and everything like that. And so this is really interesting long tail. Of uh, of services and companies that that we get really excited about as well. It's not just the the hip ones. And um, uh, to, to the relay question, so this is still a space that we are very interested in. I was going to say relay interested in, but I knew you'd do something with that. Um, so, and one and one as you know that I'm 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 skeptical about sure the the, the idea that people are going to increasingly shop where they haven't shopped before, but where they're spending maybe entertainment time or. Um, I don't know. I, I try to tell myself I'm on Twitter for work, but really it's it's an addiction. And but it, it enterprise uh, and entertainment addiction as well. So yeah, I mean, I cut you off, but I just wanted to express my skepticism, unless in case it wasn't clear by my questioning. So, <laughs> uh, so I think when. Uh, again, going back to the, the Gartner hype cycle, you know, we, d- we definitely went through one of these for, and I think I called it out while we were in it. Remember we had that ad New York thing uh, that we were on stage at and I said there'd be a hype cycle. Yeah. Um, uh, and that was kind of midpoint during the hype cycle. That, uh, that for example, everyone talked about how you would, while scrolling through your feed, um, uh, see something and, and stop and buy it right there. It, it, it's not, that, that would be a very, you know, f- fundamentally different kind of purchasing that you're willing to uh, kind of make impulse pur- purchases that quickly um, while just scrolling through your Twitter or Facebook feed. Uh, w- what Relay is about for us is, it, you presumably agree it's a safe statement to make that large existing companies with lots of assets to bring to bear on, 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 um, uh, on these sorts of uh, problems, uh, all the innovation won't come from them. Right, that's that's presumably pretty easy. In that, you know, Instacart, uh, Whole Foods did not come up with Instacart. Sure. Uh, Instacart did. Uh, uh, Unilever did not come up with Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club did. We, we think that's a fairly safe trend to bet on. Uh, and one of the things that we think the existing companies will will need to and want to do is, from a, a buying behavior pattern, not put everyone through the. The, the, the web properties and uh, and mobile properties they've developed because honestly oftentimes they're not that good and, and I'm not saying anything too controversial here because they'll tell you themselves they're not that good and the conversion data backs this up where you know uh, the conversion rates on mobile tend to be you know many times lower than desktop which are many times lower than uh, uh, than in-store in that if you have a 15% conversion rate on, on mobile which wouldn't raise any anybody's eyebrows in the retail space I mean just picture that in, in a retail sense right you know imagine you have a store and people get to the checkout line, and 85% of those people in the checkout line are like, ah, screw it, you know what, never mind. Okay. Um, uh, like, you'd be fired. Uh, and so uh, w- we think that the, the current desktop web, mobile web pattern has to change, and you're starting to change with Apple Pay and things like this. But we also think there'll be a new wave of, uh, we're very bullish on the, the kind of shop style and list, the, 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 the dedicated fashion sites that people are really passionate about fashion spend it we're, uh, we're really interested in companies like Wish, things like this, but the, the, the mode is going to change. And you know, maybe it's not chatbots, but maybe Amazon Alexa is really interesting. You know, I, again, I haven't been on the show floor, but I hear there's all sorts of kind of interesting new stuff. 
new patterns are going to emerge. And, and so, you know, one of the things that defines Stripe is the focus on developers. This is basically a development kit for the products you already have. So, if, I think what I heard was, you know, the new commerce platforms that pop up may not, it may not be Twitter, but, and it, and maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's not, but there, there will be a host of these where people are spending a lot of time engaging with products, not transacting today, but you're, you're betting that they will be, that there will be enough of these platforms where people will start transacting that, that it's worth their, all the effort and, and money you're putting into. Yes, it. and don't forget, they might even be internal platforms that you cook up yourself. Like um, Relay has been uh, great in that now there are all the, we have all these Stripe users and all these conversations going that you know we mightn't have had a, a conversation with two years ago. And so you know people like Macy's and and, and Best Buy and and kind of l larger retailers like this. Uh, and often what's of interest is there is a, a set of third party platforms that they'd like to work with that you know they see a lot of referral traffic coming from that they think they can partner with them uh, on a more interesting experience. But even if you're looking to build your own application within your own ecosystem, uh, again, API-ifying everything you have so it's easy to build new things on top of it. We think that's a pretty safe bet. Um, I mentioned the $5 billion valuation earlier. Journalists kind of get hung up on these B, B I've words. Noticed, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I'm going to bring up another company in the payment space that uh, mostly brick and mortar, but um, Square and, uh, you know, a lot of differences in the businesses, but also, but when you look at sort of the core way you make money, which is off of a transaction, similar. So I'm wondering, you know, they went out uh, as a public company last year, kind of uh, got hammered for a bit, and now it's been up and down. When you see when you see someone broadly in payments um, go through that, does that change how you think about what the future of Stripe is? whether it's eventually owned by another company versus going public? Um, well, <laughs> Any time I think you're trying to draw patterns out of too much data, it's like the, the stargazing and the constellations. And it's like, and you know, that is the warrior with the ax. And it's like a bunch of dots. Um, and uh, So I'm staring at a bunch of dots. Well, well I, I think everyone knows that newly public companies, uh, because of the way the timing of various things work, that you have the institutional investors, and then you have kind of lockups expiring, and, and the, the buy and demand patterns shift in fairly predictable behaviors, that if you overlay the charts of all recent tech IPOs on uh, on top of each other, they all follow the same curve, basically, which is they go out, and then they have like this thing, and they go down, and then they eventually kind of smoothly go back up. And so I think if you're going public, uh, you, you probably want to you know make clear to everyone that you don't think the stock price is going to settle down for, uh, for, for, for two or three years, and all the CEOs I've, I've spoken to of companies that have gone public um, say that is, is kind of a, a, a hard thing to get across, but it's really necessary because you go from a world where uh, uh, any stock price changes are very you know smooth uh, and, and well dampened to a world where it's literally fluctuating around every day. Um, but I think it's possible to create far too much um, uh, to try and read too many stories out of that those data points. That's my job. That's my job, John. So, um, so comp uh, you probably won't tell me what your... I probably volume. won't. I don't even know what the question is. Okay, great. That's a great lead-in by the journalist. Um, so I'm going to say Stripe has ten, ten, tens of billions of dollars uh, of volume. Um, is, is an IPO something that you guys think about and whether you want to be um, executives running a public company? Is it way too early to think about that? Um, it's not something that we think about. Uh, we're <laughs> you, you see some of these uh, uh, these stories from. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if any of you guys read Matt Levine, the, the Bloomberg contributor. Sure. Uh, he tra talks about people, uh, you know, the, all these unicorns, and they live in the enchanted forest of the unicorns, and try to lure them out um, uh, with the prospect of an IPO. I don't know, I feel like uh, in the recent um, uh, uh, some. Of the Events, it's um, uh, uh, not encouraging. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, we enjoy running Stripe. Uh, I don't feel like, for, for, for my own point of view, it's it's something that ranks really high on the bucket list to do this thing. Uh, and th we have plenty of medium term business objectives. And so we're not looking for an exit or anything like that. We're very happy running Stripe as a long term independent company. And, 
you know, you do know you have venture capitalist investors, right? All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So that's we'll we'll take that as a non-answer. And one more thing before I turn it out to a Q and A at the Q and A from the audience. Um, you mentioned Apple Pay briefly. Um, you obviously work with your merchant, your your apps that are your customers to get them up to speed on Apple Pay and uh, Android Pay and I don't know other there's there's a pay a day basically now. But let's t talk about those for a second. Apple Pay has come to the web. Um, what have you seen among your uh, customers in terms of uptake, merchants wanting to add that, and also what effect it's actually having on on buying on on the mobile web? Um, yeah, I, I think it is easy to get lost in all these announcements that tend to happen um, that um, it's hard to pick out the trends that are meaningful. Uh, and so I'll, I'll do my best to, to quickly summarize and, and, and pick them out for you. Um, uh, the, 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 by far and away, the most, um, I think, meaningful change in the, in the general payments ecosystem uh, over the past, say, year or two has been uh, Apple Pay, Android Pay, and uh, Apple Pay on the web. Because again, to go back to that, that you know, example of if you're a, a, an online retailer who has 15% conversion rate on mobile, uh, it's, it's, it's totally industry standard and totally abysmal. Uh, and, and it's actually hurting the kinds of things that can happen. You know, this is why you see this um, services being pushed up into apps and things like that. Uh, and so the fact that Apple Pay, uh, that Apple and, and Android are working on fixing this is, is huge because they, you know, they're, 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 Apple is much larger than PayPal in terms of number of accounts and everything like that. They own the OS and the, and the hardware. And so you know, our, our thesis when these were being released is like, wow, this is a really big deal. Um, and the data we've seen um, has, has borne that out. Uh, you know, all the, the are merchants... We gonna, are we going to talk about some data? Sure. Uh, I mean, Indiegogo uh, saw a 2.5x conversion lift uh, when they uh, for Apple Pay customers. Uh, I want I want hard numbers. You want absolute numbers? Yeah. I mean, we can get, go get to the absolute numbers, but uh, I mean, 2.5x is, yeah. uh, is pretty significant. Instacart, seeing their users check out 50% faster. Um, I, I often look to uh, one of the... One of the most underrated uh, and, in my mind, most interesting commerce companies these days is Wish. Uh, and I think everyone turns up their nose a bit at them because uh, like the, the items they sell are, are, are very cheap. And, and, and there's this kind of, uh, at least I see them, uh, I think, being, uh, being underestimated. They're phenomenally good executors. They're phenomenally data-driven. And when I am curious to see what's, uh, and very few people have cracked the, the mall phenomenon of um, Sh shopping and browsing without for, intent. For those don't, who don't know, Wish, um, hugely popular out, outside of the U.S., um, also um, in pockets of the U.S. as well, and is basically a market, an online marketplace app that's regularly like the number two uh, most popular shopping yeah, app. If you go splunking through the App Store charts, I mean, you don't have to go diving that far. It's, um, uh, it's, it's always near the top there. Uh, and they are, they're really impressive executors, and they're really data-driven. And so one of the things I do is when I'm trying to see you know, what's coming next, I just go see what Wish is doing, because you know, they, 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 they've probably run an experiment to justify it. And so one thing I noticed was that for regular customers uh, on an iPhone 6, say, who have uh, Apple Pay enabled, they've actually just turned off all all other payment methods. Like, there's just at the bottom to buy something, there's just like a big old hunking Apple Pay button. Uh, and that to me is, is, is a little bit of, the, uh, of a sign of things to come. Uh, and so Apple Pay is a huge deal. Apple Pay on the web will be a huge deal. Um, I'm sure we have some questions from the audience. Um, Wait, well, you got to do um, your like five last questions. I feel like that's the recap. Oh, yeah. Kara, where's Kara? That was great. I, I do the last question thing too, but I'm done. Um, sorry, here first and then. And then we'll you got, okay, we'll start here. Can you stand up, please? Tell us who you are. Uh, hi, my name is Carl. I work with Yarn and Dot. You spoke a lot about how Apple Pay is great, Android Pay is great, but you see a lack of traction in the marketplace. And the second thing is, like, how great is PayPal compared to Apple Pay and Android Pay? Sorry, the second part of your question is just how would I contrast PayPal and Apple Pay? Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, should, should we say that PayPal's competitor because they own Braintree? Okay, I just Sure, yeah, it. PayPal's a competitor, to be clear. Okay. Um, so on Apple Pay and Android Pay, I think there is one thing that's interesting is it's two entirely different product experiences um, uh, uh, under the same brand. And so there's the tap your phone at checkout, uh, and then there's the online payment. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes, 
these two things get confused. And actually, I saw a funny tweet um, earlier today where uh, you, you guys probably saw the, the rumored news that uh, uh, the new Macs will have uh, a thumbprint uh, reader and uh, uh, and uh, and Apple Pay uh, and showing it on the web. But uh, someone tweeted that uh, you know don't be that jerk in the checkout line holding everyone up, uh, you know using your MacBook to pay at Whole Foods. Um, but but that <laughs> but that kind of speaks to the confusion of the two product experiences that exists. And so I think with NFC the whole reader installation issue and like you never know if the reader is actually wired up for Apple Pay and so I'm just going kind of obnoxiously tapping my phone off different surfaces um, and uh, on the web uh, we've seen uh, much faster adoption or sorry on in apps we've seen much faster adoption because there's that much more compelling case from the uh, from the conversion point of view and you can see it generally if the if the app is offering you this option but you know Uber, Lyft, Instacart, Postmates all these services I mean they, they all, all all kind of the mobile apps that are at the top of the charts generally um, offer it. Uh, in terms of PayPal, so I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm uh, somewhat biased here because uh, PayPal is, is a competitor to Stripe. But I think if you look at it on the uh, on, on just the pure facts of it, um, the, there's a reason that we are uh, kind of betting on uh, working, you know, partnering with the Apples and Androids of the world rather than building our own wallet strategy, uh, as is the PayPal strategy, where uh, you are invited to set up Apple Pay when you set up an iPhone. And so you have that really high attach rate to iPhone users. Uh, they already have their vast, you know, high hundreds of millions of uh, consumer cards on file. And so they have a very large existing um, install base. And by virtue of the integration with the the uh, hardware and the the software and, and and everything they can provide a much better product experience and I think I would argue Apple Pay is a much better product experience than everything they went before and so that's why we're betting on working with the people who can be really good at the identity piece rather than trying to go it alone it's also part of the stripe strategy that we don't seek to compete on the consumer layer we like being a horizontal platform for the merchants where we let them accept money from anyone anywhere and whether that be credit cards directly or Alipay or Apple Pay or whatever, we are agnostic. And so it's actually very important that we're not then competing with our partners and providing our own wallet because that has these really interesting failure modes down the line where you're that sort of channel conflict. So we're not going to, five years from now, roll back the tape when we're hearing the announcement of the Stripe wallet? I hope then, not. Okay, yeah. good. Um, we had someone back here, Just tell us who you are. Yeah, Craig Moore with Autonomous. Um, you know, considering uh, what the W3C is working to do um, and what we see with Apple Pay and browser, you know, it seems to me that we're moving toward removing layers from commerce quickly and flattening the experience, essentially creating Amazon one click for every product sold online. So what we've seen is almost the, the, the movement of the buy button up to the product page and forgetting about the card experience. You know, is that something that Stripe is incredibly focused on in terms of that seems to me it could be the most powerful way to uh, kill off card abandonment if you don't even let someone think about it when they're on the product page? Um, you actually, th those are two examples that I've used at various points in the past. Uh, I, I, I kind of agree with you both. Uh, this promulgation of new, better identity solutions. Because let's not forget how ridiculous the current entering your credit card in is. I mean, it's literally a, a copy of the mail order catalog experience from the 1980s. Like, we presumably should be able to do better than that. Um, and so the Amazon one-click experience for, um, f for everyone, that's uh, absolutely how, um, uh, how we think of it. OK. Right here. Um, and you touched upon it in the beginning about fraud detection. So, so radar you is your new fraud detection service, is that right? Okay, again. Can you speak to your aspirations there? Because today, Stripe is pretty much encapsulated in the checkout process. You don't have visibility upstream, whereas a fraud detection system play is pervasive through all areas of the checkout, including uh, you know, when you get to payment. Is there um, a revenue strategy there? Because today, you, it, as uh, Jason touched upon, payments is a commoditized business. Is this a strategy to move upstream and then to demonstrate that Stripe and Radar can drive more conversions and therefore monetize based on that? Or w what are your plans there? So our, our thinking with Radar is, one, I would say, w we don't seek to just get into 
products for the sake of them uh, uh, and uh, or as hobbies or anything like that. You know, what we we get into products when we have a real thesis that, because launching a product has to be sort of contrarian. You know, you're, you're basically making the statement that the world works like this, and we actually think it should work like this. Uh, and so you need to have some contrarian viewpoint that the, 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 the current world is wrong in some way. Uh, and so with Radar, we didn't just want to, to launch into the space without any kind of product thesis. And so over the past few years, we've now learned a lot about what merchants tend to do, what works well, what doesn't. One, we think it's uh, from a product experience and a brand experience point of view, it's very natural for this to be integrated into Stripe. In that, imagine I was imagine I was selling you on Stripe without radar, right? It's like, oh, it's this really easy way to accept payments. And you're like, that sounds awesome. And it's like, and do you want some of the payments just randomly clawed back for no reason at all? And you're like, wait, no, that sounds horrible. Um, but, but that's kind of the experience that you get uh, w without any kind of a good fraud system. And so we think it's very na there's a way in which it's, it's very natural and, and expected to be bundled in with uh, with Stripe. The other thing then is that uh, we have in Stripe at this stage in 2016, we have a huge amount of data that we can bring to bear on on fraud. And so you, anything, anytime you're trying to determine whether something is fraudulent, you're basically saying that's not right or you know that, that that's not what I would have expected there. Uh, but you're spotting anomalies. Uh, and so to spot anomalies, you have to need to have some idea of the baseline. And we're now at the stage that when a transaction happens on Stripe, on average, we've seen that card six times before. Uh, and so we, we generally just have a pretty good idea of the baseline rate and can start to, to spot things. Then what we what we went and did was uh, one of the problems you tend to see with machine learning that goes on today is um, it's very hard for people to actually understand what's going on. I think this is one of the frustrations that we all have with machine learning systems. It's like you're traveling and your card is randomly blocked by your bank. And it's like, you knew I was traveling. Like, why is this so hard for you? Or like all these horror stories of merchants whose you know funds were frozen by PayPal and just like you're, you're, you're the, the, the kind of the random acts of machine learning systems are very frustrating. And, and so we didn't want a system that was off, unsupervised, working in the background that people couldn't understand. And so a huge amount of the development effort that went into Radar was actually taking all this data that we have in the Stripe network, training very high-performing machine learning models on it, but then actually exposing the results of that decisioning to the user. And so we're not trying to just abstract all the complexity away from you. We'll say, we thought that this transaction was suspicious because uh, f across the Stripe network, we've seen a number of attempted transactions from this IP address in the past 24 hours, which is you know across a number of different cards, and that's not normal behavior. Uh, and so we can kind of take our unique product belief and the data we have and the fact that it doesn't require any integration work, and now I think that's a product that we can actually feel good about. I think part of the question, maybe I missed it, or maybe I'm wrong, was is this a differentiator for the core Stripe product or is this a new business? Was that, or is that right? So um, there's, uh, there's some users for whom, like you know, uh, our larger users who we tend to do kind of custom pricing deals, there's some users for whom we are selling it separately as an add-on service, and so th there is that case. For most people, we just want to kind of layer it into the Stripe experience and use it to kind of continue to make Stripe a better product for them. And so, yeah, you can kind of hold product experience constant and lift revenue, uh, or you can hold uh, revenue constant and lift product experience. And we're kind of doing both in different areas, but for the vast majority of users, we just want to keep having Stripe be this bundle of stuff that gets better. And so uh, a lot of our future product launches will also be that, that way. All right, we're going to take one more question if we have one um, straight in the back. Um, Gul here from Marketa. I know, John, we were talking about this earlier. Um, how would you, looking back in hindsight, how would you critique your product strategy at Stripe? And like, to unpack that a little bit, you know, you can like go in the direction of like things you, you would do differently. Can you speak up just a little bit? Sorry. Um, Gul from Marketa here. Uh, how would you critique your product strategy at Stripe, looking back at the five, five years? And to unpack that a little bit, you could either go in the direction of like things you would do differently or perhaps things that you would do that you did not do. Um, that's a really interesting question. I do a bunch of these, and I've never been um, asked that one before. Um, so I, I think part of the strength of Stripe, but then the you know the critique, which I, I'll get to in a second, uh, but part of the strength of Stripe is uh, the product is very de somewhat deliberately uh, nerdy. Uh, 
vibe uh, about it in that there's you know, code samples on the home page and we're kind of unabashed about Stripe being a technical product that you need to uh, to integrate uh, uh, you know, our API to use and get uh, value from it. And long term, as we look five, ten years out, this is going to be a really big direction for us where we just acquired this company, RunKit, that we're really excited about, which is a, uh, a way of executing JavaScript code in the, uh, in the browser. And JavaScript is, you know, by a lot of measures, the most popular programming language in the world. And so it's a way of with zero setup, people getting started uh, building code snippets and then they can integrate them into their applications, turn them into an API. This is like a, a big direction for us and a big deal. That said, if I were to critique us over the past five years, I think the areas where we uh, have had products adopted more slowly than we wanted or where we uh, ha had you know, struggled for a few years bang our head against a wall before we really cracked something was we weren't meeting people halfway. You know, we were just talking about the technical platform and we weren't able to speak in the language of people who were trying to uh, accomplish some business outcome, you know, maybe the, the general manager of a line of business or the product manager for something. And we were kind of speaking over here in terms the developers understood and enjoyed, but we were not good at speaking to that uh, uh, f general manager or product manager for, for, for quite a while. I think we're gradually getting better at that, and, and honestly, we're gonna. Th it's something that hopefully we'll continue to get better at over the next year or two. But I think that nerdiness was was a blessing and a curse in a lot of ways. I think that's a pretty good place to wrap up. So, John, really appreciate you coming out to Thank you. join us tonight. Um,